Spirit. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I think uh, um, the first thing I wanted to say was um, uh, this is a, a non-technical presentation. This is a story about um, the journey that Telefonica Digital has been on to standing up a data monetization business unit, creating data products, leveraging the information assets that that organization has got. I'll talk a little bit about the background behind why that, um, why that is in terms of broad business context for Telefonica as a whole. Um, given it's a data, data type presentation, there's got to be a couple of stats in there which I'll uh, just share with you. Um, and then talk a little bit around the essential business proposition, i.e. what was it that we were trying to, uh, what we were trying to create. Um, and uh, certainly in my experience um, uh, through doing um, uh, information related initiatives in the past, one of the things that seems to be forgotten uh, quite frequently is um, organisation uh, capability. Um, so uh, I've got a, 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 just a, a, a brief uh, delve into the stuff of uh, people. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, of course, um, the question that all of our CEOs would, um, would want to know is, yeah, 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 but actually, does it make money? Can you, can you really create products and make money from them? So um, we're going to face right into that question. Um, uh, I think um, uh, then, um, having convinced our CEOs that, um, uh, that the answer to that question should, could, or ought be yes, um, uh, just a cautionary note around, um, uh, around data quality. I'm not going to go into uh, chapter and verse on it at all, but just to kind of just put a little marker down for you um, and then just kind of try and pull the whole thing back together with a, um, uh, some uh, summary and uh, final, um, final thoughts. So I want to... Um, I'm in the wrong way. Um, I'm going to out there, Jerry, would you? I can't do this left-handed. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I run my own um, uh, big data consultancy business and I have done for uh, a, a couple of three years now. And um, I, I was brought into Telefonica with a brief to help them sort out their data and their data strategy. Um, uh, but there is some useful context within which, um, and a framework within which I was operating, which I think is worth, is worth sharing because it's been it was quite instrumental in helping me get over the start line. <coughs> okay. So Telefonica Digital um, as an organisation was formed by Telefonica SA 18 to 24 months ago. And um, what were they? What were they trying to be? Well, effectively, if you think of the conventional mobile network operations business that provides us with connectivity as being the analogue business, the marketeers have gotten hold of those, um, uh, those businesses um, and uh, effectively they're creating a race to the bottom. Um, and we only have to look at the, um, uh, the TV adverts that are going on at the moment to appreciate what, what's happening um, and um, uh, get some uh, evidence behind the um, point that I've just made. Um, ignore the be more dog and cats becoming dogs thing that O2 are doing at the moment because who knows what the hell that's all about. Uh, but fundamentally, the previous advert from Telefonica uh, from O2 was um, Sean Bean in his dulcet northern tones going free and easy. Great words, free and easy. <laughs> and then what did Vodafone do? They said, oh, free bees, B B B B B, or free, free. And the key words there are, of course, in both organisations are free. So what's happening is, well, consumer pressure from us and or the marketeers would call it um, uh, the competitive market landscape, um, actually their creativity knows no bounds to create new sets of tariffs for us. Well, what are those tariffs? Well, I'll double the amount of data, I'll double the amount of voice, and I'll double the amount of text, and I'll charge you half the price that I did on the last tariff. And then Vodafone come up and say, oh, well, I'll see that, and I'll raise you by 50%, and I'll halve the tariff by 50% further. And that's the point I'm making, is that this thing is a race to the bottom. The core telephony proposition from the mobile industry is largely commoditizing. Okay? 
Um, and um, so the mobile industry as a whole is being incredibly innovative in its isolated pockets at looking at how they generate incremental revenue. So the board at Telefonica, hugely visionary, um, they decided to go around all their 27 operating businesses, hoover up all of this kind of capability, put it into one global central business unit called Telefonica Digital, and then look at where they could effectively leverage the great ideas in um, Colombia and deliver them into Germany, or take the great ideas out of Spain and deliver them into Brazil. Um, by globalizing the product development that was beyond connectivity. So voice over IP applications, MVNOs, which is uh, virtual network operators like Virgin and Tesco, um, apps development, um, uh, and the, the whole handset marketplace. So um, the whole of this um, industry is commoditizing. But digital's objective is to become a digital information company. That was hugely helpful for me because they had that mandate which meant that I didn't have in setting up the Dynamic Insights, which is the data monetization business unit, I didn't have to go and negotiate with 27 chief, chief executive officers. That was a really, really important piece in this jigsaw. But when I joined them, um, I had three objectives, not that they were this clearly stated at the time, but they distilled down to creating a BI unit for Tech Digital, a global um, uh, transformation program around all 27 BI units, um, which effectively um, I created by creating two programs and running a best practice capability and then a, um, a, a, knowledge, a knowledge sharing and um, a kind of a, uh, basically identifying best practice and sharing those things across, across each of the uh, 27 OBs. And then how did we monetize our data assets? Which is fruits for the so, so before I go into that, have a look at this because it's absolutely true. My job was to help Telefonica Digital lose its big data virginity. And that's what this does. So, moves on. What is three stats for you? What is big data? Well, I'm not going to go into the veracity, volume, blah, blah, blah debate, but this statistic across the bottom um, I thought was, was, was quite interesting. Um, how, whoever they are, know that from the dawn of time to the year 2003, <coughs> we've created five exabytes of data? I have no idea. But I thought it was quite, quite interesting that we're now generating those five exabytes of data every two days. And from the mobile network industry's point of view, the ubiquitous nature, moves on, Jerry, the ubiquitous nature of the um, devices um, Um, yeah, the, ubiqu the ubiquitous nature of the devices, um, and this slide kind of shows what that ubiquity looks like, um, uh, means that the mobile network industry is at the heart, particularly, of the location-based services that can be leveraged by the marketplace as a whole. So again, without going into the, an analysis of all of this, Two, two, key, two key statistics for you, that in uh, 2003, when the five exabytes of data were um, uh, counted, um, there was one device per 12 and a half people. And by 2020, there will be five devices per person across the globe. You just think about it, how many of us have got more than one mobile phone? How many of us have got more than one mobile phone and some kind of tablet device, an iPad or an iPad mini, or actually, well, I've got an iPad, but that new one is a bit smaller, and I might just be able to pull that in my pocket, so I'll get one of them as well. So all of a sudden, you've got three or four devices. And actually, the ability to kind of extrapolate that, and actually, as, as they become more usable, more adaptable, more ubiquitous, so actually they reach further and further into the um, third world uh, and uh, developing world marketplaces. And so all of a sudden you have all of these devices 
which are effectively, if one knows how to harness the data, locating everyone around the world every every time they interact with the mobile network. Okay, moves on, Sherry. Um, thanks. And um, and to that point, we did a piece of research. Um, and we were able to establish that, certainly from a, a telephonic point of view, 90% of mobile users keep their mobile phone less than one metre away 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just think about your alarm, your alarm clocks, your alarm radios. They've now got the charger things built in on top of them. You just drop them in, and it's a sound in your bed when you go to bed. So, so it's not that hard to appreciate that these things are with us all the time. They're always on in some way, shape or form because of the way in which they communicate with the network. So the ability to understand the movement of people is significant. Effectively, what we did was we decided that we were going to suck in all of the data out of the mobile network operators. We were going to t turn a few handles and turn that into a series of data products. We were going to build in basically a digital analytical platform in which we ingested all of the network events off of the mobile network. That data in the UK alone is 1.5 billion network events per day, every day. In Brazil, which is the second country that we've launched the business in, it was five times that number. And in Spain, even larger again. So we're processing in the region of 18 billion network events per day to create effectively products in, um, in the uh, data monetization space. So you describe what a network event is? So a network event is every time you make a phone call, your phone is making a request to the network to do something, to open a, open a call connection or to um, uh, route the call to this phone number or you send a text message. So every time your handset is interacting with the mobile network infrastructure, the cell towers, that's an event. Okay? It could even be, whereas you're talking and walking, you move between cell towers. And that is also a network event. And understanding what those network events are and how to use them is essentially the data that we're sucking up. Alongside that, we're also ingesting the CRM data from the postpaid contracts. Um, just move me on, Jerry, if you will. <coughs> so what happens when you go 4G and it's all IP then? Um, the, 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 the network information, we will still be taking the network, the network event data. But won't the interesting network events be hidden in the IP traffic? Uh, well, not necessarily, uh, because the, net, the network topology still needs to be able to understand the transaction, the operating transaction between the handset and the, net, and, the, and the cell tower, whether that's a 2G, a 3G, or a 4G tower. Turn it off, I'll talk, I'll, t I'll talk about privacy in a minute, actually, because it's quite an, quite an important point that, 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 that um, uh, everyone should be really clear about. So the monetization route, the monetization debate can take two routes. Okay, the first one, regardless of which industry you're in, by the way, this is not just mobile, uh, not just about mobile. It's a, it's a broader point that I'm making here. You've got internal monetization and external monetization. And, um, and who owns it inside of the organization? Well, there are a few places where it could be owned, but if you have a business like Telefonica, which is moving towards a, being a digital information business, put it under the remit of the chief digital officer and not the CIO. Because it's a business-focused problem, not an IT problem. IT needs to enable it, of course it does, there's, there's cloud infrastructure, open source software, la 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 la. You know, and and, and um, uh, you move go to most big data presentations, and they will talk about Hadoop, um, and so what? Really, it's a piece of it's a piece of tech 
that allows some of these things to happen more readily than you might otherwise have been able to do. And actually, the challenge to the CIO, in my opinion, is one of figure this out to reduce my time to market. And we stood the whole business up in eight months from start, from concept right the way through to standing the business up with the first, the first product being trialled with real customers, which is, um, uh, as, as Jesus will uh, acknowledge, is warp factor within the mobile network industry. It just doesn't happen. Okay, so do you move forward? Um, so the business model, and this was the reason I managed to get the investment out of uh, my internal stakeholders, is quite, um, quite an exciting one from their point of view. And I think of it, and I described it to them, as a Rubik's Cube. And what we were doing was we were building one cube in the Rubik's Cube. And this diagram tries to demonstrate that. So by taking the, the raw network event data, you can apply different types of data science to it to create different products in different verticals to solve different business problems. So we had our first product, which is called Smart Steps, which is targeting the retail sector. We were able to identify that by manipulating it a little bit, we could build a product in the advertising and media measurement industry, which we call outdoor media measurement. Um, Journey Vision, the th third product in the transportation industry, um, and, um, and a fourth one in financial services around fraud management and improving, uh, particularly in um, the developing economies, um, reduced credit risk um, capability by, because of the ubiquitous nature of the mobile phone, the mobile phone network uh, operators have got the people that the financial services industry don't have, because people have got mobile phones they don't have mortgages, they don't have credit cards, and they don't have financial agreements with anyone, but they do have a mobile phone, which they're using in conjunction with their mobile network operator. Um, in Telefonica's case, they have 27 countries that they're working in. So if you build a product once, you can deploy it with minimal change into those 27 countries. So if you're going to say X million in revenue in product one in country one, you've then got one, two, three, four, and you know, so you've got 27x actually in potential revenue terms. Then you've got these other products here. So let's say that you can generate y million in the second product. So now you've got 27 times x plus y. So that begins to get quite interesting because 27 times x plus y, where x and y are both numbers in millions becomes a bit of an interesting business proposition. And then the third thing, which is, um, which is the bit that really excites me, um, <coughs> is that um, this axis represents introducing other external data sources um, and um, increased data um, science sophistication. So the more in which you can apply data science and modeling, and therefore move into predictive capability and predictive analytics using the data, so you actually move up the, up the z-axis. And the more you move up the z-axis, actually the more money you can charge. So if you could charge x million down here, then you can charge x squared million as you move up here. So, so each one of these products then started to get its own product roadmap with increasing levels of sophistication in the, in the product capability. And I'll try and demonstrate that to you in a minute. Um, so this was the business model. So for an investment of several millions to get this thing up and running, they could see that the business opportunity globally was cubed. <laughs> and, um, and that's what convinced them that there was, um, that there was a real opportunity in the space. It moves forward. Um, <clears throat> I did say, I'll talk a little bit about privacy. Um, my biggest internal stakeholder was not my CEO of Telefonica Digital. It was the legal department. And it was not just the legal department of Telefonic and Digital, but it was the legal department of each and every one of the operating businesses that we were going to deploy the product into. Why? Because those operating businesses were giving me their data. And in giving me their data and creating data products, were we running the risk of increasing um, their, their repu in, increasing their reputational risk? And so we had to come up with a methodology 
which allowed us to be able to state really clearly to anyone in the marketplace that every single piece of data that we used was completely anonymized. We were building products that were in the main aggregated and extrapolated because O2 in the UK has a market share and a, um, uh, and a regional bias um, and a demographic bias. So um, by dealing with that and extrapolating up to give us um, counts to represent the whole of the UK population, we were effectively further desensitizing the personal information that was being potentially generated. Um, and the, way I, the best way I liken this is to just say, um, uh, those of us who go to a football match on a Saturday afternoon, um, the following day we read the report in the Sunday newspaper, and at the bottom it said there were 37,502 people at the game. And you say, hang on a minute, I didn't give you permission to count me. So actually, you newspaper need to make that 37,501. Right? It's nonsense. Right. It's absolutely nonsense. That's not what you would expect. And the products that we've been, build, we've been building are largely that kind of thing. Okay. Essentially what we've done is we've divided the whole of the UK up into 250 metre grid cells. And we're taking all of the network events, triangulating the data, putting each one of those events into a 250 metre grid cell, and grid cell over time. So you can do trending analysis, you've got demographic profiles, and so on and so forth. But like you do have the option to do personalised base. On an opt-in, on an opt-in, on an opt-in basis. Opt basis. But we're using all the network data, and for those propositions, it absolutely has to be anonymised. Okay. So, so that's essentially what we were what we were doing. That's the heavy lifting that was involved. Just a, a word on a, a word on organisation. So. Um, I brought in a team of organisation design um, specialists to help me sort this out because when I've done uh, transformational work in the past, it's always, i found, it's the thing that most people forget to do. They go to HR and HR just draws sticks and boxes. And this is not about doing that. It's about so much more than that. We were trying to stand up a business unit that was an information business that was not a mobile telephone business. So I didn't want guys who sold tariffs to be my take-to-market team. I needed guys who understood either the retail sector or data products that they could sell into the retail sector. So going and getting a guy who sold handsets or tariffs to Mark Spencer was really not helpful to me. I needed, a, I needed a team of people who were specialists in the space. So we did that. Also product development. The mobile network industry has a habit of saying, well, we'll go away and do it ourselves. Threw that paradigm away and said, we're going to bring in industry specialists who've got retail or financial services or whatever experience, bring them into the organization, get them to inform the product developments, and then get the product out into the market almost as a pre-alpha release and get the feedback, which was a cultural challenge. But then having done that, having just ignored the protocols and just cracked on and done it, then I had to say, well, how am I going to put the organization together um, to make sure that we retain our agility? And the only way you can retain the agility is if the people who are in the boxes that the HR people have put together are really clear about what their single year points of accountability are and what the interface is between this role and that role. So I did quite a lot of work on building out a effectively a target organization design and target operating model for the uh, new organization. Because if you can't, it doesn't matter what your technical methodology is, if you're using Agile or whatever you're using, you're only as agile as a business as the slowest link in your decision-making chain. So we need to be really clear about what people's accountabilities were in order for them to be clear about the decision-making. And as I say, I brought in a team of third-party design consultants to do that. Um, and the final thing was, I knew we couldn't sell this on, all on our own globally. So we went into the market and we examined who we could partner with, and we signed a global deal with GFK, the uh, market research company, third or fourth largest market research company in the world, um, to actually act as our go-to-market partners uh, in order to augment our salespeople. Moving forward again. 
Um, so products, do they work? Right. So I mentioned earlier about going up the z-axis, and what I'm trying to demonstrate with this is the opportunity is, is exactly that point. So this kind of represented the the roadmap of the retail product. So we started by understanding the network events and putting them onto the grid, which is here. But what we realised was not only did we know where people were, i.e., they're here now, yeah, so we could count in the grid square that this building is in that we're all in here, assuming we're all on the same network. Um, but equally, we know where you've come from. So actually, for each place, each 250 meter grid cell, we could build out a catchment area of where people have come from, what their origin was, in order to be here now. Okay. So therefore, understanding that actually helps the retailer then understand the market that they have at their disposal for that retail outlet. Okay. Then you get closer in, and then you know that. So you know where they came from. You know that they're here. And then by merging in the Wi-Fi data, you'll then be able to get inside the building. Okay. So by getting inside the building, so in this case, let's say it's a shopping centre, you pick up the Wi-Fi points inside the shopping centre, and as you relay between those Wi-Fi um, base units um, in the, uh, in the uh, shopping centre, so you're able to understand the movement of people, more than the do individuals, but the movement of people as a crowd, through the shopping centre. Then the same thing applies when you get inside the building inside of the retail outlet that you decide to go into. I'll give you one example. There's a, there's a big store on Oxford Street which is an O2 Wi-Fi customer. So we went into that store and we very simply identified each of the base units. And we just said, this base unit is in ladies' wear, this one's in lingerie, this one's in ladies' footwear, and so on and so forth. Right? So, so we made a note of the MAC address of each one of the base stations and assigned a general department to it. We then went away and did the analysis and we were able to say what the routes were that people were taking through the store. So in this entrance, 35% of the people went into ladies' wear. From ladies' wear, 64% of them went into, into, into men's wear and 23% then went into, uh, back into uh, toiletries and so on and so forth. And we were able to do that for every single department and what the path strategy was, and therefore the exit strategy was, for all of the people who visited that store. More importantly than that, we could deal with the recency, the frequency of a visit, how often do people come back, and the dwell time that they have in each one of those, each one of those departments. When you have that information, you're on the verge of being able to build out a loyalty program, which is all based around the fact that you've got your mobile phone connected to the Wi-Fi network inside the store. And that's what that then represents. And then this line here says, we can provide all of that information. The retailer knows what their transactions are. So all of a sudden, they're then beginning to understand what their real conversion looks like right the way through this piece. And then the online, to, to, uh, well, to your question of earlier, the whole thing around the online piece, well, we can take the online data as a transaction and work it back and put it back into the plug it back into these into these segments because we can assign location to every single one of those online transactions. So that's the kind of the power of what, what we're trying to do here. And that's the kind of the retail product, which was the first product we put into the market. And its first guys was called Smart Step. <coughs> Next slide. So dealing with catchment area, just as a kind of a window in on this for a second, um, the shopping centres of Blue Water Park and Lakeside Thurrock. Um, and although um, uh, this slide doesn't, um, uh, doesn't show particularly well, there are, um, uh, you can see the, the kind of the predominant um, catchment area of each one of them and what their hinterland is. So the further out they go, actually, you know, the, the, the penetration um, decreases. But actually, uh, although this slide doesn't show it, down here, uh, there is some red. And just outside Chelmsford, there's some green. So there are people in Chelmsford who are bypassing Lakeside Thurrock and coming into Blue Water Shopping Centre. We have no idea why they're doing that, so we don't have those insights. But in knowing that information, the whole marketing strategy for both of those shopping centres can be changed or challenged from its preconceived, um, its preconceived paradigm and thereby improve the marketing effectiveness 
of that program. Next slide. One of the other th yes, sure. Go on. <coughs> Grace's analytics. Uh, can you compare the, the general footfall versus sort of the, the mobile intelligence so you can see what the percentage your percentage of sort of accuracy is. So are you getting sort of twenty percent of the, the individuals travelling into to Lakeside or is it ninety percent? Do you have you got a stat around that? So we so we we would know in each one of those two hundred and fifty meter grid cells yeah. how many people are there by hour of the day. Wow. In camp in real number terms. And you can compare that against what the football would be in Thurrock, for example, or, or Lakeside. Well when you start to merge when you start to merge it with the Wi-Fi data, mm -hmm. then you can start to say the number of people who are in the bin versus the number of people who are inside of the actual physical retail outlet. And you can start to do those kinds of comparisons. Mm -hmm. The product at this stage doesn't do that because we're still really in the infancy of the product development. Yeah. But we have proven out elements of those elements of those uh, those things. But you can say quite clearly the number of transient visitors you have with mobile devices is 30% compared to the football law. So we're, we're modelling up to say, using the mobile information, what the total footfall is, so it restates back to the total population. Because right. one of the other things that we're doing, which is what this slide is about trying to challenge, is to say, we need to know the movement profile. So the people who are at home, the people who are at work, and the people who are passing through. Mm -hmm. And of the people who are passing through, how many of them are on foot and how many of them are in cars or on trains or whatever it is and of course we had to solve that problem for the counts to be valid numbers in the footfall product mm. so we had to come up with some location based and dynamic location based algorithms in order to figure out the, um, uh, the movement of people and what this was trying to illustrate is just the denser the blue the higher the population of movement in that grid cell, people in cars basically. And you can see this is kind of the ring roads around Manchester and um, uh, as you can, you know, as you would expect, you're kind of hugging the, hugging the, ring, road, the, the ring roads. Now the interesting thing about this is not so much to dwell on the validity or the accuracy of this as a piece, but in trying to solve that problem, we were able to figure out that we could understand people who were on trains. So then we've got people who are in cars and people who are on trains and all of a sudden we had multimodal transport analysis and as a result of that we sold to a number of, mo of train operating companies um, information about um, uh, routes and passengers on trains and the capacity and the market size and for one train operating company we were able to identify that their market share was several percentage points lower than they perceived that it was, simply by having the hard information available to them. So the thing I liked about this and the reason we're putting it out there was in trying to solve one problem with one product using data science, we were able to actually lift it, shift it, move it across and create a brand new product in another vertical, which actually becomes another revenue stream and another cube in the Rubik's Cube thereby demonstrating that the base, the, 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 the x-axis that we were talking about in the three-dimensional model is actually valid. Okay. The retail product, I have to say, um, has been bought by two customers and is currently in trial with another five of the UK's top brand retailers. So we've sold into the train operating companies, we've sold into the retail industry. Does it sell? So I've got one more use case to just talk you through. I'm just moving on, Jerry. Right. How many of us have ever been abroad and had our credit card refused? Yeah? Yeah? Money in the account? Piss you off? Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time. Right. So, plane lands. What's the first thing that you do? Plane lands, comes to a halt. What's the first thing that you do? Switch your phone. So you switch your phone on, you stand up and you pay to switch your phone on. The first text message that you get is not the one from the wife or the girlfriend or the boyfriend. <laughs> the first one you get is usually from bloody Vodafone saying you're now on this and this is your roaming tariff and blah 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 and money money expense. And you think, oh jeez. Imagine a second one that comes in at pretty much the same time that comes from your bank and it says, Jerry. 
Nobody yeah. 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 <laughs> it's okay. We know you're in Kuala Lumpur. You're okay to use your credit card or your debit card. And that's what this ecosystem is showing because that's what we were able to do with the roaming data. So we ran a trial. So this is back to the methodology of minimum viable product, get it into the marketplace and learn some lessons. We ran a trial with one of the top credit card issuers in this country. We had 1,500 people in the test group, 1,500 people in the control group. We were expecting that what it would do by pushing this piece of information, not just to the mobile phone, but if you push it to the mobile phone, you can push it the other way and tell the bank. Right? So effectively, you land, you switch on the phone, all the roaming communications all start to work. We tell the bank, the bank says, okay, issue that text message, welcoming them into Kuala Lumpur and saying, yeah, have a nice day and use your credit card. All right? You can move, I mean, it's fantastic in a scary kind of way at the end of the day, but um, I mean, are you going to go, sorry, for the, Phil, in the, in the consumer space, for example, so I can imagine the first one is from Vodafone saying, I'm charged three pounds, three pounds, but the second one from the bank saying, well, it's Kuala Lumpur. And the third was going to be from the wife saying, what the hell are you doing in Kuala Lumpur sort of scenario? Yeah. <laughs> are you going to take that next step? Well, well no, we're not, we're, not, we're, not going to sell, we're not going to sell the data to your wife unless you want to pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> How did you link the phone to the bank account? We don't, the bank does. We simply provide a messaging service back to the bank and they integrate it into their so support systems. Is. The bank then gives us a whitelist of the people who are right. signed up and every time the roaming system right, okay. triggers to say, we're going to change your tariff because you're roaming, it triggers a message to say, oh, you must be somewhere to do the roaming, where are you? And then push that information back to the bank so and they send the text fulfillment. So those who have what I mean whatever their market share is, it's not 100% but they have a market share. Wouldn't, you're only ever going to have a percentage of people. Sure. Wouldn't it be a lot more powerful if the data is anonymous? Rather than Telefonica setting up a Telefonica digital, there being a mobile phone operator's digital, and they all just aggregate together their data. Cash flow. Exactly. What you really that's, that's my vision. <laughs> that's my vision for the industry as well. Isn't that what we did, though? For one use case and one use case only. Right, okay. And that's push based advertising. Okay. It does not have the remit to do this piece of work. Okay. But you're absolutely right. That is what we've has done. They are an amalgamation of the same network event data. Yeah. But their only use case the is adverti is, is adverti push based advertising. Right, okay. Okay. Not just retail based push based advertising, so not as in not just location specific, i.e. you're outside Starbucks. Is a, is a voucher, yeah. not just that, but actually any push based advertising. Right. Okay. And they're working with their use cases. But as you can imagine, three mobile network operators, the politics, the inertia, they haven't done the organization design effectively. People aren't clear of the accountabilities. It's consensus management rather than internal consult and then singular point of accountability. They take, they take, an age to make any decision. Right. Okay. That's an organisation design problem because they allowed HR to just do sticks and boxes. You're not an HR fan, are you? No. <laughs> no, I'm not. Are okay. you able to say how much that drove it up? By? Going to talk about that now. Yeah. So, um, just skip this one, Jerry, and we'll move on. Um, so, um, in running the trial. We were expecting that there were going to be operational efficiencies. You didn't any, as a subscriber to the service, you didn't need to ring the bank anymore to say, I'm travelling to Kuala Lumpur, or I'm in, going to be in Paris tomorrow, I'm in Europe on business, whatever. You didn't have to ring the bank anymore. So we thought there'll be an operational saving there. Tip, there was. 30 odd percent reduction in the number of calls to the call centre on, on that proactive basis. We also expected, as a result of it, that there would be fewer calls from Mr. Angry saying, what are you doing refusing my credit card, you muppets? I rang you the other week to tell you I was going to be here. Why have you refused my credit card? We thought there'd be a reduction in those things as well. Tip, 80 odd percent reduction in that, which was all happy days. But the thing that blew us all away, and nobody was expecting this, was that there was a 43% uplift in the number of transactions undertaken by that cardholders in comparison to the control group who were traveling at the same time. 
I'm not surprised by that because it's terribly embarrassing having your card declined when you're trying to check out of the hotel. Can't be said to someone that was in or wherever it is, yeah. Mm. Right. And you use the card that is front of wallet. Mm. And it's front of wallet because you've got a nice friendly customer experience message saying, Well, we know you're in Kuala Lumpur, have a great time, exactly. you're okay to use your credit card. So that 43% uplift in number of transactions at 2% for the, for the credit card company equals happy days. But equally importantly, how many of those people who've increased their volume of transactions are going to actually not pay off the bill at the end of the month? And thereby, you've got potentially 18.7% APR <laughs> against that increased level of debt. Not that I'm advocating the promotion of credit card debt, you all understand, but really compelling set of statistics. The, the bank that we were dealing with, the, the credit card issuer that we were dealing with, said this thing is needle shifting in our business. What's the thing that holds it back from just effectively becoming this global next big thing is exactly to your point, cross-net capability. And until you can deliver cross-net capability, these things are significant, but you can't attack the entire customer base. And the banks and the credit card issuers, what they're going to want to do is they're want to, going to be able to want to go cross-net. They don't care that their customers are O2, Vodafone or EE. They don't care at all. They want cross-net solutions. And dealing with cross-net is harder in the mobile network industry than getting two different retailers on the high street to talk to each other. And I've tried to do both, and the MNOs are far more paranoid even than retailers, and I didn't think that that was possible. So just moving on, Jerry. <coughs> um, so does it work? Can it make money? Can it be? Can this data be leveraged? Yes, it can. There are some challenges associated with it. When you're dealing with it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, like the credit card uh, proposition, then you need the cross-net capability, and we don't have that. But actually, a very powerful story and very powerful proposition. In the, in the space where you're dealing with aggregated and extrapolated statistics, crowdsourcing effectively, then yes, you can make money. Sold to the transport companies, sold to the uh, retailers, um, <coughs> and... So that business, in my, in, in my expectation, will, will now start, start to grow. Um, and they are, it is being done globally. It's being done in the UK. It's being done in Brazil. And they're about to go live in Spain. And if it hadn't been for some paranoid uh, journalist um, from Stern magazine in Germany, it would already be live in Germany as well. So for potentially going into 2014, Telefonica Digital will have deployed this capability into four different countries, four different markets, effectively same products in those marketplaces. Um, data quality. So all, if you guys are going away from here thinking, how do we externally monetize our data? The, the quality of data that you need for your core business operations to be effective is different from the quality that you need to be able to deliver those kinds of products into the marketplace. I'm not going to go into any, de any more detail than that, other than to say the quality of the network information we had to build the products was lower than we were expecting, and we had to put an awful lot of infrastructure in place to help deal with that problem. And that's actually caught, caught us out in terms of our overall profitability projections going forward. Um, uh, so, as a, just as a cautionary note and as a word of advice to any of you that are thinking about doing it, don't assume that your data quality will be good enough to do this kind of thing. I will virtually guarantee it won't, and you'll have to figure out how to deal with that problem. Um, next slide. So, how did we do it? We did it in eight months, okay? Um, and then in the following nine months, we built out other products and started to put them into the market. So, the, the, the financial services one is one that we put into the marketplace in, the, in that second nine month window. Um, the, the, uh, the transportation product is one that we developed and put into the, into the market in that, in that second window. We stood up the business unit, we stood up the organization, we recruited the people, 
some of them, and in the end it was a blend between internal and external people because you can't, you know, I took a very polarised and jaundiced view just to act as check and balance to the culture, the internal culture of the business unit. I only looked 25 when I started this thing 18 months ago. <coughs> um, and I feel as though I'm about 55 now. Oh, actually I am. Um, so how did we actually do it? Well, we dealt with the existing business model. Telephonic and Digital had given me the space within which to do that. We took a very different view about organisation. It was not about just going and getting your favourite people from inside of the mobile network industry and giving them a great and interesting job in this space. Absolutely not. We needed competent and capable people who were competent and capable in these spaces, not as being a mobile network operator. Um, examining the leadership model, we actually put a PL business unit together with a formal CEO, and for a period, I extended my contract with them to become its interim chief operating officer to help them kind of take the next set of products into the market and industrialize the data management processes in the back office. Um, throwing away the existing take-to-market model, we use the existing uh, take-to-market teams of the mobile network operators as the door openers. They have the relationships with Mark Spencer, Tesco, et al. And we just simply got them to go in and open the door. We said, thank you very much. And we walked through the front door to engage then the marketeers, the retail location planning people, et cetera, et cetera. We, used, we then had those conversations because it was then talking about consultative selling and their business problem rather than, you know, mate, here's a tariff. Okay? Slightly pejorative, but you get the point I'm trying to make here. Um, didn't buy a single piece of software or a single piece of hardware to do this. Did the whole thing with the credit card using Amazon Web Services, stood the whole thing up in Amazon's cloud using open source software. We used to dupe at the back office with a whole raft of their bolt-on bits and pieces. And the only Uzi I know is a nine millimeter. So um, the all of this stuff was done using open source software and even the product database is open source software. We use Java and JavaScript in the front with APIs into other services like Google Maps. And of course taking the managed risks. And then finally, um, I'll just tell you this story because I, this was quite interesting to me. Um, there was a company in America who built out a platform and they're doing some stuff with Verizon and Sprint. And we had a great conversation with them a few months ago around their platform and the infrastructure created to do this. And it dawned on me, and I actually said it to them, that 12 months earlier we could not have had a conversation with them because we would not have appreciated the value in their platform because we did not know what we didn't know. 12 months later, having been on the journey, having got a few battle scars and hopefully I've shared a few of them with you this morning, we were able to say, now we know what we don't know and we're in a position to have a conversation with these guys. Um, and they, their, their investors who happened to be with them at the time absolutely loved that. The fact that we were able to acknowledge that our maturity was such that we couldn't have spoken to them 12 months earlier um, was... Um, it was just um, manna from heaven for them, really. So that we moved from the unknown unknowns to we now know what we don't know. Um, and that, that, you know, that's been a really uh, valuable lesson for us. A couple of other points are just worth making. Architecture in this space is key. Product architecture is key to your agility. Not just using Agile as a methodology, but componentizing your products so that you can get reuse and more rapidly build new products. And data architecture is absolutely fundamental to flexibility. The first version of the product that we built and gave to Marcus Spencer around the catchment area, they said, that's great. But can we do a catchment area for women between the ages of 35 and 45? And we said, no. Because the data architecture that we built didn't support us being able to do that. Does the data support it? Absolutely it does. But the architecture of the data in the product didn't allow us to help them answer that question. So we're back to the drawing board, redesign the data architecture, plug it straight back in, and now they can do those kinds of things. Um, and then I guess really, um, um, 
You have to get clear as well about the uh, debate between the product and the platform. Um, is one building a platform which is a service or is one building products to solve specific business questions? And the one other thing that I guess that we know is, having been on this journey, is that we now know that there are so many solutions to this mo use of this mobile network data out there in the marketplace. We couldn't possibly either begin to understand what they are, nor could we ever scale the business to answer all of them. So where Telefonica are now is now thinking about how they move to an API-based exposed data API business model that then allows other people to make use of the data. And that's essentially the journey. It's been, um, it's been um, uh, an 18 month white knuckle ride. Um, learned a lot of things and um, uh, just trying to kind of share those things from a non-technical perspective because you get the data geeks in the room or you get the data scientists in the room and it will all be about stuff down and in rather than up and out. And this thing is absolutely about business and business opportunity and leveraging your information assets to drive shareholder value in your own organisations. With that, I'll show you.